Let's see. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Back by popular demand is today's guest. Her name is Dr. Christy Funk. She is the author of Breasts, the Owner's, Ma Owner's Manual, and today she's going to be discussing 18 foods that can help you prevent breast cancer. Please welcome back to the show, Dr. Funk. You are as smart as you are beautiful, and it's always a pleasure to see you. Always great to see you, AJ. I'm so excited to be here. I have a lot to share today. I know you've got a show. I mean, you've always had a book, but you have a, I mean, you, you, you got your fingers in a lot of pies and we want to know about everything that you're up to because you're helping so many people. Uh, thank you. I'm so glad to be able to share with your community, my community. So there is an amazing venue online called Pink Lotus Power Up. It is completely free and you just dive in there and start rummaging around and you will find yourself just enthralled by all of the offerings. So there's everything from online active community where you can be chit chatting and posting photos, getting together in local chapters. Just yesterday we went on a big hike in Pacific Palisades that was beautiful ocean view. You. So the local chapters are spread throughout the country and you get together to hike, to bike, to camp, to cook. And really it's all about empowerment through community, love, support, friendship. We've got breast buddies in there, which is a matching system between newly diagnosed women with those who have been there, done that. So if you're newly diagnosed, again, completely free, you just go in there and put in like 45 years old, lumpectomy, chemotherapy, and broop, like match.com, but for breasts, <laughs> all these women who are about, you know, plus or minus five years your age, same stage, same treatments. And that way, like meets like, age for age, stage for stage, again, solely for community and psychosocial support. And I have my newly launched Cook Live, Cook Live with Chrissy and Dr. Christy. It's once a month on Wednesdays. It's coming up just in uh, two days where we, you can join us via Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. But if you sign up via Zoom, that's where I answer the Q&A live. And we always have super fun giveaways. The upcoming one is free tickets to my live summit at the gorgeous Oceanfront Terranea Resort. It's over $1,200 value. And um, that is my other passion project, the summit, where I distill 25 plus years of medical wisdom into a three-day event packed with actionable start right now power, everything from what you eat to what you think from what you do to how you love and forgive. It's all encompassing and super life transforming. So that's what I've been up to. Well, you are very busy. And how do you have time to be a doctor? <laughs> I know. Well, I have a lumpectomy on a cancer in an hour and a half. So <laughs> oh my goodness. I well, the show it. sounds fabulous. <laughs> I hope people will look below in the show notes and I'm going to definitely check out the show. But who is Chrissy that you do the show with? Chrissy is a holistic nutritionist. She's been a plant-based warrior for a decade now, and she's a physical therapist. So we, she also happens to be one of my best friends, but she's steeped in the science as am I. And we just have a wonderful time together because what happens is Chrissy makes the best sous chef. She'll be busy chopping or grinding away on certain things that we're talking about. But I get to then transition to wax eloquently about like, oh, we're making a black bean burger, beans, fiber, protein. What is the microbiome? What does it do? Why do you care? How does it love beans? So I get to teach in these little pearls of wisdom that make this whole idea of food as medicine. Food is delicious medicine. When you say food is medicine, you kind of think cherry cough syrup. Like, no, it's incredibly delicious and nutritious and fighting for you every time you chew and swallow, which is a lot about what today is about. But the cook lives allow me to kind of wax on about the power of phyto plant-based nutrients. I love it. I love that you hook people up. You like they become breast buddies. Exactly. I know. I'm all about the hookup. That is so cool. I love it. Now, I know you have a presentation you want to share. Did you want to hop right into it? I do indeed. So here we go, everybody. We're going to talk today about my top 18 anti-estrogenic breast food, superfoods. But I will say at the top of the show here that anything that has the power to literally inhibit the creation, proliferation, metastatic potential of a breast cancer cell, you bet 
has a lot of implications regarding anything that's pro-inflammatory, creating oxidative stress, DNA damage, and immune system dysfunction. In other words, everything I'm about to talk about today not only will decrease your risk of getting breast cancer or of having it recur, but it will also decrease all of life's killers, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, Alzheimer's, obesity, and the things that don't necessarily kill you, but just kill your life of the joy and of the the um, the productivity that you wish you had. That could be irritable bowel syndrome, asthma, chronic joint pain. It goes on and on, right? Right down to acne. That could just make you have a downright bad day, big zit on the tip of your nose. So all of these foods are gonna fight not only breast cancer, but everything in life that brings you down. So we're gonna jump right in the top 18. The first is perhaps the most controversial and may surprise you the most. This is soy. So the real deal on soy, people, this has been vilified throughout the ages by, oh, a lot of people, including yours truly. So confessions, when I went to write my book, Breast the Owner's Manual, I dove into the nutritional science on soy to prove to everyone in my book with facts that what I've been telling all of my breast cancer patients, and frankly, all my patients for 18 years was correct. And that was to spit that miso out of your mouth. It's a plant-based estrogen. In case you don't know, 80% of all breast cancers are fed and fueled by estrogen. Hence the importance of today's topic, anti-estrogenic foods. So estrogen receptors are like little antennas sitting on cancer cells. And when estrogen from any source hits this receptor, it's going to send a signal to the cancer to multiply and divide. Hmm. Okay. So hence phyto plant-based estrogens should probably be very bad to consume, right? We thought so for a long time, but when I dove into said science, embarrassingly wrong. Not only is soy a type of estrogen that is safe to consume, it's actually anti-estrogenic in a good way that helps reduce the occurrence, recurrence of, and death from breast cancer. And I'm about to show you the studies that prove that point, but I wanna just give you a tiny bit of science real quick. So there's two estrogen receptors in our body, turns out alpha and beta. Alpha is the one that sits on the cancer cells. So I was just describing the mechanism of estrogen hits alpha and alpha says, hey, cancer, multiply, divide and spread, right? But with 1600% more affinity, the isoflavones like genistein and dadezine in soy hit beta receptors. And what or what do they do when they hit beta receptors is pretty fascinating. Number one, they shut alpha down, almost acting like a tamoxifen blocking it or stopping that alpha receptor. And number two, they go out into the periphery. We have fat cells. This is an important concept because I'm not going to repeat it repeatedly throughout this talk, but I need you to know the other main source of estrogen in your body. The first is your ovary just spewing out straight estrogen. But if you're postmenopausal, that little guy has shut down or they have shut down. So you've got one other source and it is fat cells. Everywhere you have a fat cell, you have an enzyme. It's called aromatase and it's busy all day long turning pre-cancer steroids like testosterone and androstenedione that are coming from your adrenal gland. Aromatase converts these hormones into estrogen. Okay, so you're going to hear about aromatase inhibitors, foods that block the actions of aromatase, and that is in fact what soy does. So if this is true, then if you go to Texas where they don't generally consume that much soy and you find a bunch of premenopausal women with high enough estrogen levels that you can measure changes, right, because their ovaries still spew it out all day long. And you have these women drink three 12 ounce cups of soy milk a day, every day for a month. First you draw their estrogen levels, then they drink the soy, then you come back a month later and draw their blood. Depending on where they were in their menstrual cycles, because you have higher estrogen levels, right, at certain times, ovulation, right before your period, depending on where they were, blood levels of estrogen dropped between 30 and 80% in every single woman and estrogen levels stayed lower than baseline for another two to three months, suggesting that the soy you consume today will decrease that bad acting estrogen for many, many weeks 
to follow. Okay, so that is proving the point because soy is not going to stop your ovary from functioning. It's not like they stopped ovulating or menstruating. So it really was about the aromatase inhibition. But what we really care about is if you consume soy, do you have less breast cancer? So yes, the answer is yes. If you eat daily soy, then should we expect to see less breast cancer? The Shanghai Women's Study, very high volume, over 73,000 women, showed a 59% drop in premenopausal breast cancer for high versus low consumers of soy. Here's an interesting thing. If you look at the next study, this is, now we're moving on to America, but these are still Asian women. I have other studies to share with you. Uh, but American Asian women who have a child and hood intake of look 1.45 soy servings a week versus less than that so this is not a ton of soy you'll find out in a minute i'm advocating for two to three servings a day and they just had one and a half a week and yet as a child intaking that little amount of soy they had 58 percent less adult onset breast cancer Another favorite study of mine, Korean BRCA gene, mu carrier, gene mutation carriers. Why is this a favorite? Because despite today's topic, if you have a BRCA1 gene mutation, 75% of the cancers that that gene mutation leads to are estrogen negative, technically triple negative, which is the most aggressive, least curable cancer we surgeons and doctors have to treat. So in this population, just because of soy consumption, we had 43% less breast cancer, both estrogen positive and negative. So that's really powerful and speaking to more than just the anti-estrogenic properties of soy, but really just the overall anti-carcinogenic properties. All right, so, oh wait, I've got one more. So this one is um, over 52,000 North American women followed for almost eight years. I like this study because it's a real slice of American pie with almost 30% of the participants being black who are technic uh, traditionally underrepresented in a lot of our studies. So I love that we've got a healthy population of our African-American sisters in this one. In the study period of almost eight years, around a thousand new breast cancer cases developed. And when they analyzed for soy milk, versus dairy milk intake. They found 32% less breast cancer for the average intake of soy versus dairy. And just a little aside here, when comparing the 90th to the 10th percentiles of pure dairy milk consumption, so just the dairy milk drinkers, if you had the most versus the least, you had a 50% increase in breast cancer risk, implicating dairy as one of the drivers toward breast cancer. But that is a topic for another day. All right, so now I've kind of gone through showing you how with the Texas ladies, this mechanism might work in one axis, the aromatase. Then I wanted to show you how if you are a high versus low soy consumer, you will overall have less breast cancer, averaging around a 32% drop. But what if you already have breast cancer, right? Like, mm, is it dangerous for you to be drinking soy because estrogen and all that, despite what I said? Well, until 2009, we didn't know for sure, and now the studies have poured in, and every single human study looking at breast cancer and soy consumption repeats the same echoing refrain, which is about a 32% drop in recurrence and death from breast cancer. Let me prove it to you. This study, almost 2,000 multi-ethnic survivors, these women were taking tamoxifen, a blocker, an estrogen decoy that blocks the cancer receptor. They were followed for six years, and the high versus low consumers of soy had 60% less recurrence. Well, maybe that was really all about the tamoxifen. We do find that there's about between 40 and 50% drop in breast cancer recurrence on tamoxifen. By the way, if you're on tamoxifen, that means you had an estrogen-driven breast cancer. But this next study kind of teases out the difference. This is 6,200 multi-ethnic survivors followed for 9.4 years. They overall, high versus low consumers of soy, had 21% less all-cause mortality. But look at this. There was a 32% drop in the mortality, the death rate from estrogen driven breast cancers in women who were not on tamoxifen, suggesting that there's like a synergistic effect right between just being a high soy consumer with a history of estrogen driven cancer 
or you could be high soy consumer plus tamoxifen and you get an even bigger drop in recurrence and death, which is 60%. And then again, here we go, whispering back to my BRCA carriers, this estrogen negative mortality was dropped even more than estrogen positive, 51% drop in death from breast cancer in the soy consumers. The studies go on. So there's 5,000 breast cancer patients in this one, high versus low soy, 32% less recurrence, 29% death, another biggie, 9,500 breast cancer survivors on a fairly wimpy half cup soy milk a day had 25% less recurrence than those who drank less than that. Finally, this 2021 study is a really nice summary of all of the human studies looking at soy and other endpoints that soy has been implicated in causing disruption as an endocrine estrogen mimicker right out in the body. So this looked at 417 human studies and it looked through all the concerns over the safety of plant estrogens. Um, and this is nice again because it's all in humans and what they determined they looked at all of these reports and all the human data and isoflavone intake and concluded that isoflavones and soy are not endocrine disruptors so plant estrogen intake does not adversely affect thyroid function estrogen levels hello breast cancer ovulation in women semen levels in men uh, no negative effects in children which is a little um generic way of saying, no, you're not going to get little boy boobs from drinking too much soy. Um, well, too much is, a, is a, there was one case study where a 19 year old boy developed gynecomastia, prominence of the breast tissue. He was literally drinking a gallon of soy milk a day. So let's just be reasonable in the soy consumption. Okay, moving on. Next anti-estrogenic superfood, cruciferous vegetables, leafy greens, right? We've got our whole family here, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, turnips, radish, watercress, kale, arugula, collards, bok choy, and Swiss chard, to name a few. So the key here in all of our leafy green vegetables and the cruciferous is to understand the high isothiocyanate content in these foods. And that is probably the primary reason for breast cancer reduction. Um, there's also something else called indole-3-carbonyl, which takes excess estrogen and makes you pee it out. So there are these two mechanisms, but I want to belabor a little bit this isothiocyanate business. So it turns out that the magical compound phytochemical sulforaphane, but sulforaphane doesn't exist in your foods as stated as is. You have to chew. And when you chew, you break down cell component walls, the cell membranes, so the stuff inside of them can mix. And when they mix, you get the release of something called myrosinase. It's an enzyme that takes your ITC, your isothiocyanate, and transforms it into this literal like cape wearing superhero of a thing called sulforaphane. Now, cooking, heating, otherwise destroys myrosinase. So if your favorite food on planet Earth is roasted broccoli, as is mine, here are your workarounds for not, for not missing out on the big bang for your broccoli, right? The thing is you want the myrosinase back. And the thing is it's in the raw form. So you take your roasted broccoli, you chop up a few florets of the raw stuff and sprinkle it on. Voila, the myrosinase is back and you're back in action getting all the sulforaphane that you need. My kids are always like, mom, you have to make everything so healthy when I sprinkle it on. But if I don't do it in front of them, they have no idea that it's there. <laughs> so, I know. Um, mustard <clears throat> seed has myrosinase also. So you could have whole grain mustard if you're eating something that you'd want to dip that in or just sprinkle the powder. Or the um, pre-cooking ritual of chopping your vegetables and letting it hang out for about 45 minutes will release all the myrosinase and create all of the magic. And then when you cook it, sulforaphane is not destroyed by heat once already present. All right, so there are all my tips. But what I really wanna tell you about is broccoli sprouts. So broccoli sprouts have 100 times the sulforaphane content as broccoli. And there are these cells inside our breast cancers that are thought to perhaps be the masterminds of breast cancer recurrence and death. They're called stem cells. You're also born with stem cells. They're super useful. They can become anything you need them to be inside your body. They're like these pristine recruits that can swoop in and become a brand new liver cell after too much 
Ativan or alcohol or detoxing um, from medications has left some cells injured in your liver, right? A stem cell will go replace it. And that is a beautiful thing. But these same qualities that make stem cells so important in our bodies, migration, right? Able to go somewhere, colonize the area, proliferate, self-renew. They're basically little immortal beings. What if they got hijacked? by a sinister source, a cancer perhaps, right? Now this cancer has this mastermind of evil abilities to proliferate, colonize, migrate, and never die or never say never. So what one study, now albeit I'm gonna just say it's mice, but this is so powerful, I want you to understand it. They took a bunch of mice and they grafted breast cancer stem cells, both estrogen positive and negative onto the mice. And then they injected their abdomens with sulforaphane, our superhero of the moment. And over a three week period, you literally saw the stem cell size go from existing to smaller to smaller to gone. The power of sulforaphane is such that it can take away all of the things that a little cancer cell mastermind needs to exist and proliferate and metastasize and take your life. But how much sulforaphane are we talking about here, people? Like, is it 12 gallons of broccoli? Because I'm not going to be able to eat that a day. So remember, we've got 100 times the sulforaphane content in the sprouts than the broccoli. And all the, the studies were then done through Harvard. It was very interesting, but I won't belabor it because I have so many more foods to talk about. But brrr, answer is a cup and a quarter of broccoli sprouts will give you the amount of sulforaphane that was the human equivalent of what was injected into the mice to make the st cancer stem cells explode. Amazing. All right. AJ, are you amazed? That's amazing, actually, really. <laughs> right? I know I'm so in love with broccoli. I have it every day. Oh, there are three things I get inside my body every single day without fail. It is a half a cup of raw or lightly steamed broccoli for the myrosinase reasons. It is three servings of soy, be it through fermented sources, tempeh, miso, natto, uh, tamari, or your lightly processed soy milk tofu, uh, edamame, soybeans. And number three, number three is flax seeds. So the magic in flax, I always get two tablespoons a day. I want you to get at least one. Um, it, it, they are the most concentrated source of healthy omega-3 fats on the planet. They have over 100 times, some studies saying 800 times, the lignin content. We're going to highlight that word, lignin content of most other foods. So lignins exhibit all kinds of anti-breast cancer virtues related to lowering estrogen and stopping cancer cell growth. In one study... 45 women got a biopsy that showed precancerous cells. This put them at high risk to make breast cancer. Then they simply ate one teaspoon. Remember I'm saying they have two tablespoons a day because that's six teaspoons, but they just had one teaspoon a day um, of ground flaxseed. Ground is key. You don't have to buy it that way, but you have to grind it because you will just poop it out if you eat the whole seed. Your body can't break down the hole. Okay. Um, and by the way, if you buy ground or ground it up and have more, put it in the fridge, it lasts three months, then it goes rancid, throw it out, start again. Ah, I could go on and on about flax, but right now I want to tell you this. So they had a teaspoon of ground flax a day for a year, and then the biopsy was repeated in that same spot. The precancerous cell changes reverted to normal in 32%. And a biomarker for cell division, I'm going to talk about this again right now. So understand it, KI-67. It answers the question, hey, what percentage of cells under the microscope here are actively dividing, like one becoming two? KI-67, the lower the percent, the mellower the change. And if we're talking about cancer, the lower the um, doubling rate. It went down in this study in 80% of the women. So lignans are anti-estrogens and they slow abnormal cell growth and they're anti-angiogenic. Angio, blood vessel, genesis, birth, the birth of new blood flow. Every single cancer in your body, breast or otherwise, if it aspires to be bigger than the tip of a ballpoint pen, needs to create its own blood supply. It creates angiogenesis by spewing out these chemicals that say, hey, blood vessels, make your ingrowth over here, bring me some food, and then boom, exit strategy straight to your brain, lung, liver, 
bone. So angiogenesis is bad when a cancer is making it. And anti-angiogenesis is the squelching of those routes of exit. So we love anti-angiogenic foods and flax is a big one. <clears throat> so they in increase, lignans increase endostatin in your bloodstream and endostatin inhibits tumor angiogenesis. This is a fun study. It's a muffin a day study. So we had 32 breast cancer patients. They had their biopsies done, right? Core biopsy diagnosis of cancer. Let's look at three things about that core. Let's look at the um, apoptosis, the programmed cell death or cancer cell suicide rate, how many are exploding and done. Let's look at the um, CRB2 expression. This is a marker of aggression on the cancer. And finally, my favorite, KI67, the division rate. What percentage of you guys are dividing and busy right now? Okay, everybody gets a muffin. So we're talking slice of American pie people, right? This is um, no change to their diets, their exercise, whatever that they ate, uh, bacon burgers and whatnot, um, so be it. We just added a junk food muffin to their diet every single day, except half got a placebo muffin, half got a muffin with the equivalent of two tablespoons of ground flax seeds a day, every day for five weeks. Now we do the lumpectomy or mastectomy. I got the whole tumor after five weeks of flax exposure or placebo. And what, oh, what do we find? Shocking. The division rate dropped 34.2% in the flaxseed group. The marker of aggression went down 71%. And the cancer cell suicide rate went up 30.7%, all from two tablespoons of ground flax seeds a day. So that's a must do, peeps. More about lignans. This is a study from New York. It reported a 71% drop in breast cancer death in postmenopausal women who had the highest lignin intakes. So just a little, you know, more real world stuff about lignans. There's they're much fancier in Europe. So this 2012 study comes from Italy. And at surgery, when the women were getting their breast cancers removed, they had some blood drawn and cryopreserved it. This is wild. So 23 years later, we got 180 women who had died, 112 of them from breast cancer. And now you can compare way back 23 years ago, who had the highest lignin levels in their blood at the time of diagnosis all those years before. And what you find is that this graph shows the cumulative incidence of breast cancer related deaths in those with low blue line levels of lignans versus red high levels of lignans in the blood at the time of surgery 20 years ago. So the high levels in red had 58% less breast cancer death at the five-year mark. In other words, even if you're like a really good plant-based eater and you should get a breast cancer, what I have seen repeatedly in my practice, except maybe for those who also can, can um, who have gene mutations that predispose them to inherently more aggressive cancers. But save for that small subset, my plant-based eaters who have been plant-based for a good, say, at least five years, but even 10, 20 years, even they can get a breast cancer. But without exception in my practice so far, they always tend to have lower division rates. And they have this kind of underlying biology of the cancer that if left inside of them might kill them when they're 180 years old. And I mean that for real. So there are indolent, lazier tumors that are almost uniformly estrogen driven, which gives us so much opportunity to stave off recurrence through diet, more diet and lifestyle tweaking. Anyway, I digress a bit, but I'm just showing how these high lignin consumers, um, which you're never gonna get lignans out of meats, um, they st had two decades later, a protective benefit. So here I am showing you at 10 years out, the benefit for the high lignin group in red is smaller, but they still had 33% less death one decade later. And here we are with 17% less death 20 years later. Okay, next food, fiber. It's not really a food, it's a whole category of foods. Why do we love fiber so much? Oh, so many reasons. But a wimpy 30 grams of fiber a day will drop breast cancer by as much as 40%. So how do you get 30 grams of fiber? Here's a quick cheat sheet list. Black beans, lentils, split peas, one cup will have 15 grams of fiber. 
Avocado, a medium-sized, 13 grams of fiber. Berries, one cup, eight grams of fiber, particularly raspberries have a high amount. Pearled barley, one cup, six grams of fiber. And then my also favorite broccoli, a cup has five grams. So what is fiber doing? It's crushing cancer's dreams because it binds estrogen and toxins in your GI tract and you poop them out. Um, it also improves insulin sensitivity. So elevated insulin comes out when there's elevated glucose and this leads to elevated inflammation and that whole inflammatory cascade leads to many illnesses and badness. Fiber also via your microbiome, it's the favorite prebiotic, right? It's the favorite food of your gut microbiota. And they chow down on the fiber and release a litany of antioxidant vitamins and anti-cancer compounds, including the lignans we just talked about, isoflavones we talked about in the soy and phytate. So high fiber um, even quells the more aggressive estrogen negative cancers which I've talked about a couple times now. So you want to try to get 30 grams a day and more is even better. But by guessing, just you guess, how many Americans reach 30 grams of fiber a day? 3%. Oh, AJ knew. <laughs> 3% is such a wimpy amount. And I, I think one of the things that's emerging in, in why fiber is so important is that it's a lot more than just about bowel movements. We're learning about how these microbiota release short chain fatty acids, which also have a whole host of um, anti-inflammatory benefits in your body. But to be honest, fiber is also about bowel movements. So what, okay, there is a study that correlated precancerous changes in the breast with the frequency of bowel movements in about 1500 women. And those who pooped less than twice a week versus those who pooped one or more times a day, the, so the slow poopers were 4.5 times more likely to harbor precancerous changes in their breast cells. Why? Well, many studies show that bile acids can damage DNA, right? So much so that they can initiate cancerous changes. Your liver dumps the bile acids into your intestine as a way of getting rid of cholesterol. But if you don't poop often enough, the transit time is really slow through your small bowel and colon, giving your body a lot of time to reabsorb back into the body these toxic um, metabolites, the bile salts. So what, it gets in the body again and into the breast? Yes. Of all the crazy things to study, there's a study that shows that researchers radioactively labeled bile acids that women swallowed nine days before their breast cysts were aspirated. And then they analyzed the fluid, which lo and behold, contained the radio labeled bile acids. So yes, carcinogenic bile acids get into your poop, get into your bloodstream, enter the breast, and there apparently they can exert estrogen-like cancer-promoting effects. And this would possibly explain why our constipated ladies have 4.5 times the amount of breast cancer as our super poopers. Who are super poopers? Because, among other things, they eat a lot of fiber. All right. Oh, I put this here. This is kind of fun. I just, I digress. Here's now a it's time to answer more of your questions. Cyst Our first comes this was, in an email. This was, um, if you notice, I'm as big as a house. So in my defense, I am eight and a half months pregnant with triplets in this video. Sound. So when I put the ultrasound probe down on a mass, a little bit of normal breast tissue there. Breast tissue right here. Yep. And the All upper the part of your ultrasound, correct? And now when I roll over, there's boom, a cyst. That, that black circle very so, so sharp black borders fluid. black is fluid gray and shadowy black can be cancer but you see how sharp the top and the bottom like you drew it with a pen cyst the way you get light going right under the cyst you see that bright white gray on the underside there that shows that the ultrasound beam is going through fluid it can't go through cancer it bounces back I, and that's dark i mean you've seen a million of these i mean in your mind you see that 100 you know, benign okay not worried at all and good news rebecca good news. There is something we can do. We can get rid of that fluid. Are you ready? Okay, quick alcohol swab just to clean the skin. This is how easy it is. Now, will you ever send this fluid for culture and, and I do, I send it when I'm worried. On the count, I have to talk to Rebecca for a second. On the count of three, little poke, Rebecca. One, two, three, poke. 
See that needle? Right, right in that Watch cyst. This. Watch the cyst. Basically, all that's collapsing. That is needle. so cool. Pulling back, I'm going to get every little drop out of here, Rebecca, so it doesn't come back. Right. <laughs> okay, so I was just showing you how fun it is to aspirate cysts. It has nothing to do with um, anything, really. Okay, so, <laughs> except for the bile acid study, they aspirated cysts, and that's how easy and painless it is, right? The girl didn't even flinch. Um, but I, it's one of my favorite things is when a woman comes in with a mass that she's like, literally this popped up overnight, which may or may not have been true, but if it's a cyst, it probably was true. And when I put that ultrasound down, and I can just be like, cyst, like, she's just like, what does that mean? It means it's totally benign, like fastest cancer ever cured because you didn't have it. Like it just is the most beautiful moment in my practice when I get to just like lickety split, take care of this woman's fears. Ah, oh, it's so nice. Anyway, okay, moving back to our number five food, berries. All right, a large amount of elagitanins and elagic acid can be found in berries, blackberries, strawberries, pomegranates, but also in black tea, green tea, almonds, walnuts, pecans. And I want to tell you a little bit more, more about the um, elagic acid and elagitanins. These compounds in berries are transformed by, bam, back to that gut that we're learning so much more about in uh, these current uh, study times. I mean, honestly, when I was in medical school, we knew there were bacteria in your gut. We thought it literally just had to do with digesting some of your food and then you pooped them out. End of story, moving on. Like now the microbiome is the subject of huge books and research studies. So I'm so excited to be learning more about our microbiome. And here's one of the um, hot new creations from, it's probably not new, it's probably been creating it for, you know, countless thousands of years, but new to us. And that is that the elagitanin containing foods that I just mentioned are transformed by gut microflora into urolithins. So urolithins are emerging as a new class of anti-cancer compounds that can mediate their cancer preventive activities through cell cycle arrest, aromatase, aha, you guys are experts now, the fat cell enzyme inhibition, induction of apoptosis, remember cancer cell suicide, and tumor suppression, as well as the promotion of autophagy, auto self phage eat, where your immune system eats the damaged, dying, deranged, inflammatory producing cells. Senescence, which are the old guys, sorry, got to go, you're causing too much inflammation, that's what the senescent cells do. And they can uh, perform transcriptional regulation of oncogenes, turning on the good ones, off the bad ones, and growth factor receptors. So urolithins, they're kind of a hot new topic. And you know, all of the foods on the list, as I said, come with like a stunning array of studies that show how various phytochemicals and nutrients affect breast cancer occurrence, recurrence, and death. But they're also, as I said, the same mechanisms are, are um, turned on to limit other diseases. So I wanted to take a second to tell you about berries and your brain. So a study at Harvard showed that just one cup of blueberries a week slowed down rates of cognitive decline. And then another Harvard study, apparently they love berries over there. This one um, was over 20 years long and it followed 93,600 women. And they found that those who ate the most versus the least berries had the least cardiovascular disease and type two diabetes. So boom, right there with one cup of berries, you're protecting your breast, your brain, your heart, and your response to insulin. Next up, apples. So can an apple a day really keep breast cancer away? It seems so. So daily apple eaters in one study, not apple pie people, but actual whole apples, had 24% less breast cancer than those eating fewer apples. And of all the apples studied, the red apples um, with their anthocyanins had slightly more power. But it really, in another study looking at petri dishes, extracts from the peel stopped breast cancer cells in the lab 10 times more effectively than from the flesh of the same apples. So you want to eat them whole or blended and never juiced where you're not getting the peel. Next item, tomatoes. Lycopene is an anti-inflammatory, anti-angiogenic, so squishing, squishing those blood vessels, um, such that it can slow cancer cell growth. You stimulate cancer cell suicide, you limit free radical damage. So um, 
lycopene is an important chemical that we want to get in our bodies, but unlike most phytochemicals, which are best consumed in their raw state, like we were talking about with broccoli, cooking tomatoes for just two minutes increases the lycopene bioavailability by 54%, 15 minutes of cooking, 300%. Why? It seems that you're disrupting the cell membrane and it allows the lycopene to be released from the tissue matrix more readily. Also, lycopene is fat soluble. So you wanna bump up absorption even more by consuming your cooked tomatoes with something fatty like an avocado or olives, or you can saute them up in a tofu scramble and you know, soy, uh, tofu has not a lot, but like about four and a half grams of fat. So you wanna eat it with fat. Next up, mushrooms. Okay, what, what would you guess? Like if I gave you all the fan, portobello, chanterelle, oyster, crimini, what, which mushrooms have the most flavones and isoflavones of all the mushrooms? I'm gonna guess just the plain old white ones. You are right, Chef AJ is right. Maybe because she already knew, or she said that for sure, which gave it away. But it is the wimpy, cheapo, white, button mushroom that has this highest level of aromatase inhibition, right? So aromatase, again, converting the precursors of estrogen into estrogen. One study showed that intake of 10 grams, the equivalent of half of a button mushroom, like the tip of your thumb, basically, dropped breast cancer rates in Chinese women by 64% compared with age-batched no mushroom eaters. So shrooms, yay. Okay, this is an, a favorite of mine to wax out a little bit longer about. So remember how cooking destroys the myrosinase? You don't make the sulforaphane. This is the same story, but different words. So you can crush, chew, or chop immunity boosting bulbs and you'll get all of the power. But if you cook them, you've destroyed the enzyme called alienase that then converts um, precursors into the powerful alien compounds like allicin so again same old trick you can just whenever i saute up something a stew or soup or whatnot that has onions and chives and shallots at the base i just brrr, chop up some of the fresh stuff and garnish the dish with it and boom the alienase enzyme is back in action so one of the major compounds in our allium veggies particularly garlic and onions um is Quercetin. And this compound shows impressive anti-estrogenic and anti-proliferative activity. In fact, quercetin slows cancer growth down enough while also being anti-angiogenic and pro-apoptosis, fancy words that you now are well-versed in, um, so much so that it's considered an anti-metastatic substance. So how powerful are they? This intriguing study dipped extracts from 34 vegetables, on petri dishes filled with eight different types of cancer cell lines. MCF7, by the way, over here, that's always an estrogen progesterone positive breast cancer. So your typical American salad, ironically, isn't doing much. You've got like carrots and tomato and some romaine lettuce over here where your control is here. So it seems like the proliferation rates, like, I don't know, maybe these cells actually like salad, wimpy salads, but over, um, here, the runaway winners are cruciferous veggies, which I boxed in green, let me lower this, and garlic and onions, which I boxed in blue. So look at that, look at our little bars. You go all the way, the, the clear runaway winners are all the cruciferous veggies where pff, the proliferation rates are squelched by like 80, 90%, and you're barely even detectable, if detectable, by your onions and leeks and garlic. This may be why a French study that I love showed an astounding 75% drop in breast cancer with 12 weekly servings of allium vegetables a week. Next up, seaweed. There was a Korean study that showed the daily consumption of gim, which is edible seaweed like a sheet of nori, uh, you know, the sushi wrap, drops breast cancer by over 50%. This might be because seaweed favorably alters the estrogen metabolism or maybe um, probably by modulating gut bacteria again back to that microbiome that we're learning more about 
Uh, but it also might interfere with estrogen actually binding to estrogen receptors. In any case, I want you to try snacking on sheets of nori instead of chips or throw a teaspoon of powdered spirulina into a salad dressing. Uh, one small word of caution, sea kelp, which has a, a, a lot of iodine in it, might be worth avoiding if you have any risk for thyroid cancer just because we don't need excess iodine. Okay, next up, turmeric and other spices. Could curcumin, which is the most active ingredient in the pungent yellow herb turmeric, be the reason breast cancer rates in India are literally five times less than in westernized countries? Perhaps. What we find is that the piperine in black pepper actually increases the bioavailability of curcumin from barely detectable to 2000% higher in some studies. So um, make sure you always have your turmeric or curcumin with black pepper and like the lycopene, it's also fat soluble. So add some flax or avocado or olives to the mix to max out absorption. Or soy milk, which has fat in my smoothie. So I'm going to, at the end of our discussion, show you how 13 of these 18 anti-estrogenic superfoods can easily be blended into a delicious drinkable breakfast smoothie and the other five quickly sauteed into a yummy little plant-based uh, breakfast or lunch. Okay. Next up. Oh, I wanted to tell you about the um, turmeric and curcumin. So when they go head to head in Petri dishes on breast cancer cells, the turmeric has a higher breast cancer kill volume than curcumin. So there are some synergistic effects of other phytonutrients in turmeric. So whenever you have a choice, I just use the whole spice turmeric and not like those curcumin capsules. I mean, you can just go phyto chemical, I mean, um, nutraceutical industry crazy with some of these things like, oh, we read that study that Dr. Fung mentioned about curcumin decreasing breath. Let's make a curcumin pill and let's add pepper and let's add fat. And why don't you swallow that down? I don't know. Why don't you just put turmeric in your smoothie or on a little rice Buddha bowl or yeah, I'm a bigger fan of food than I am supplements, although supplements can and do have a place. Cacao. Okay, my sweet tooth friends. Finally, I'm getting into something truly delicious. Cacao is um, got some caveats to it. So basically consuming 1.5 ounces or 40 grams of more than 70% cacao, solid dark chocolate, gets an absolute anti-cancer thumbs up. It delivers antioxidants more than it does cocoa fat and sugar, unless you buy something that added the cocoa fat and sugar back with oils and milk and other horrible things. So cacao beans actually, get this, contain more antioxidants like polyphenols and flavonoids than many other well-known superfoods that I've already mentioned, like blueberries and green tea, which I haven't talked about yet, and even red wine. Um, so antioxidants, we throw that word around so much, but here's a nice little visual of it. Cut an apple, put it out, and about an hour later, the surface is gonna be brown, right? it's oxidized. You squeeze some lemon on there and whoop, an hour later, it's not brown at all. Same thing with that guacamole that you made and nobody, it, people didn't finish it. So you put it in the fridge and then you take it out the next day and it looks like there's a layer of complete poop on top and nobody wants to eat that stuff. If you just slice an onion and put a little raw onion right on top tomorrow, it's as green as the moment you made it. You're welcome. Um, but that's the power of antioxidants, right? It, prevents this oxidative layer, like rust on pipes. So how beautiful and awesome to be protecting your cells in that same way as they are exposed to oxidants inside your body. So a tablespoon of cacao, um, in addition to having the high antioxidant level, also has two grams of fiber. So there's another way to get a little bit of fiber in your day. And it's also been shown that it really might decrease stress, particularly anxiety and depression. And I've got a whole other talk to give about how stress impacts immune function and can affect illness and breast cancer in particular. So decreasing stress with a little bit of cacao might go a long, longer way than you're suspecting. So um, as I kind of mentioned in passing, we add milk aka fat and sugar and oils to cut their bitterness of cacao you might not like it as it comes until you kind of grow into that taste like people who don't like black coffee but they suddenly love coffee with a bunch of cream and whipped cream on top like that's kind of what you're doing to your chocolate your cacao 
Um, so it just makes it a high glycemic, totally fattening, unhealthy choice that actually elevates breast cancer risk. Take a look at this. Uh, over 5,000 women, half with and half without breast cancer, were compared in Italy, and they found that the highest versus lowest third consuming sugars, which consisted of sugar, honey, jam, marmalade, and chocolate, had a 19% increase in breast cancer risk, thought to be due to the chronic elevation of insulin and IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor, which is the subject of another of my Chef AJ chit chat. So you might wanna look up one of our older segments, we talked a lot about IGF-1. So in other words, I just want you to look for 70% or more cacao without milk, oil, or sugar added. You need to read the ingredients and you'll avoid the marketing trap of brands like Hershey's Special Dark, which comes especially made with milk fat, processed with alkali, which is a process known as dutching, which removes basically all of the, most of the, to be honest, most of the antioxidant content and power that I just talked about. And it has some sunflower oil in it. Whereas this brand just has the cocoa beans with a little bit of sugar and cocoa butter and some ground vanilla. Okay. And it's organic and um, fairly made. Okay. Red grapes. Red grapes. These, the, the magic in red grapes there are numerous ones and it kind of fall into the categories of things we've already talked about. One big biggie being the elagic acid, but another one being resveratrol. Why isn't it? It's not even on my list. I took it off because I was going to highlight it and then I didn't put it back. That's funny. Okay. But resveratrol is our sort of red, red wine caped superhero in the literature for some red wine. Um, but it turns out the amount of resveratrol that really exerts anti-cancer properties you're never going to get from drinking wine you'd have to drink so much you'd be like passed out before you got the amount of resveratrol that i want you to get but it's highly concentrated in the skin of red grapes and particularly the ones with the seeds so we're finding that resveratrol is so interesting as an anti-cancer compound that it's being studied as a standalone um, treatment for people with cancer. So I would highly recommend that you chomp down about 10 red grapes a day. Next up, whole grains. I think of whole wheat and whole grain bread and pasta, brown, wild, black, red rice, whole oats, quinoa, frica, farro, popcorn, without a bunch of butter on it, without any butter on it, whole rye, whole barley, buckwheat, whole wheat couscous, bulgur, amaranth, sorghum, teff, right? These are all our whole grains. And when I was, I'm a product of the 80s, right? I was a, a teen in the 80s and bread, pasta, rice, and potatoes just made you fat. Like if you looked at those foods, you would blow up. And so when our family became completely plant-based, I was so elated to reintroduce grains into my eating. So I have a couple of hints for you. One is that if you look at the total carbohydrate uh, content of a food label and divide it by the fiber content, if that number is five or less, that's a good grain to be eating in terms of the fiber content. So for example, if you take like an Ezekiel bread, and then you look total carbs, I, I don't have it memorized, but it's something like 25 and then the fiber is five. So the Ezekiel bread will be an equal five. Um, so look at your grains that way. Always make sure the word whole is present. Um, there's so many things that confuse us like semolina. Well, there's no word. It doesn't say enriched wheat flour and it doesn't say whole. Well, semolina is not whole. <laughs> you need to see that word. What we found from whole grains is, you know, they're they're mostly big on fiber. And I've talked now before about how fiber binds estrogen in your GI tract, how the whole bile acid salts get um, excreted when you're trying to get your 30 plus grams a day. And indeed, all the studies on grains and breast cancer show that it reduces its incidence, it slows cancer cell growth and benefit lowers heart disease. Next up, citrus. So citrus fruits, grapefruit, oranges, tangerines, clementines, tangelos, lemons, limes, these all have been shown to reduce breast cancer, slow growth, stimulate cancer cell suicide, limit free radical damage, and protect your vision and lower heart disease. So what's going on with citrus? Like, for example, when you think vitamin C, you might think orange juice. Yep. 
citrus fruits like oranges and tangerines, um, they bestow a real modest 10% reduction in breast cancer. It's not that big of a drop, but when all of a sudden you add other vitamin C sources and therefore multiple phytonutrients like carrots, sweet potatoes, greens, broccoli with citrus, you amp up the protection to 31% drop in breast cancer. In other words, eating plant-based, the whole eat the rainbow has cellular effects that always benefit you. Okay. This is our number 16 anti-estrogenic breast superfood. It's anti-inflammatory, it's anti-estrogenic, it's anti-diabetic, and anti-atherogenic, which is plaque buildup in your arteries. I picked a very purposefully uh, confusing photo. You don't know if that's the size of a grape or a melon, but what is this food? In my favorite food study, researchers recorded the total antioxidant content of 3,139 foods, um, spices, herbs, supplements that are used worldwide, everything from like Coca-Cola to coconuts. And at the very tippity tippity top of the scale, highest antioxidant content recorded was the Indian gooseberry, scoffing at the blueberry 124 times beneath it. <laughs> so. I want you to understand this antioxidant power. Plants on average carry 64 times the antioxidant power of meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. So when your carnivore loving friends say something like, well, meats have antioxidants, uh, like barely 64 times. What does that actually mean? Let that sink in. So gram for gram, for example, in order to ingest the antioxidant content in one cup of blueberries, imagine it had it been Indian gooseberries, which was 124 times, but I wanted to be a little more common to your local grocery store, a cup of blueberries. What do we got here? It's 100 grams, it's 57 calories, and it's 0 0.3 grams of fat. To get that same amount of antioxidant power, you would need to eat 27.5 slices of cheese pizza, which would actually be 2,750 grams instead of 100, 7,590 calories instead of 57 calories, and you'd be eating 323 grams of fat, basically pure saturated fat. So back to our um, Indian gooseberry. So you can find it in some Indian grocery stores, but for the most part, it's best found in its powdered form called Amla. And at pinklotus.com slash elements, we have an online store that I'll briefly mention when I'm done. But in that store, we have a very ref refined, well-studied, high-grade Amla powder called Amla Boss. So you might want to check that out for your smoothie. All right. Number 17, aloe vera. Aloe vera. Okay, so you think of that as a plant. You know that you put aloe vera gel on your skin when you're sunburned. So imagine if you were able to have a highly potent drinkable form and those same cellular components get inside your body to decrease inflammation in a direct and tangible way. Ace Manin in aloe vera revs up your immune system with these inflammation reducing cytokines, so much so that diabetics who drank aloe twice a day for two weeks saw lower blood sugar and triglyceride levels while promoting cellular immunity. Another study shows that the anthroquinones in aloe suppress breast cancer activity by decreasing ER alpha. So alpha receptors, right, sitting on the cancer cells, there are a couple different ways to come at this receptor. One is to block it. That's what tamoxifen does. That's what soy does in part um, with way less signaling capacity when it hits the receptor. Um, and that way your own, it's like a car in the parking spot you wanted and your estrogen can't get in to fuel the cancer. The other way is to just take away the fuel, that's your aromatase inhibitor. And the third way is to actually degrade the receptor off the cell to begin with, so it just isn't there. And that is what the anthroquinones in aloe vera do to estrogen driven breast cancers. Again, back to elements, we have a really high quality aloe tonic that's unique. 
Um, it's not going to be the same as like the aloe drinks you're finding in Erewhon or Whole Foods because it's extracted without any heat and it preserves 200 plus essential nutrients in the aloe vera plant that can otherwise be destroyed by heat and processing. And it includes all of those that boost immune system function. Um, this is it fully retains all of the structured water properties of the plant. And of course it's completely organic and raw and it's pure. But what I love is it's also fortified with a proprietary blend of 10 plant-based support herbs for additional health benefits that have all been shown to be adaptogens. So another um, option for you when you're looking for aloe. Our number 18 food is gonna conclude here with a pop quiz. What is the most common beverage enjoyed by people over a hundred years old? Water, tea, red wine, or gin and tonic? Yes, AJ. I'm gonna say tea. And you would be absolutely right. Of all the teas, the clear winner though is green. The high epigallocatechin gallate, EGCG, antioxidant content in green tea, fights cancer and often wins. You derive a number of health benefits from all types of tea, so don't get me wrong, tea it up, green, black, white, oolong, even herbals uh, and non-caffeinated, they all uh, don't come though from the powerful tea plant, Camellia sinensis. So as such, herbal tea lacks EGCG, which is the powerhouse, but so do black and oolong teas because brewing destroys catechins like EGCG and not with, say, matcha green tea. So gulp down the green variety if you're really getting after cancer, and I want to show you why. This is a fun study. So uh, FIP, FIP is a really nasty heterocyclic amine, HCA, potent carcinogen that forms whenever you cook beef, chicken, pork, uh, and fish, right? It's the most abundant heterocyclic amine found in the human diet, and it's associated with developing breast, colon, um, and prostate cancers. So at levels of FIP that you would achieve by eating normal amounts of food cooked like chicken, breast cells go from normal here in white drip a little FIP and they get more abnormal. Oh, sorry. Drip a little more FIP. They get increased. What are we looking at? Cell proliferation. This one is cell migration, the ability to move and then invade, break that milk duct wall in your breast and move on into the blood vessels to metastasize. So the white bar is your control. As you drip some FIP, it gets increased in whatever we're talking about, proliferation, migration, or invasion, drip some more FIP, it gets worse, drip some more FIP, and it gets worse. Okay. Now, what happens to all of these biochemical and molecular changes if you drip two extracts of green tea on normal breast cancer cells? Uh, nothing, 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 nothing. Straight line across, right? Nothing, because it does nothing to normal healthy cells. They're not gonna get healthier, right? So here's the magic. What happens if you drip FIP onto the cells and then, that's bar one, you add green tea extracts, presto changeo. The cells essentially revert to normal as if FIP never hit the scene. Here's normal, here's FIP induced change. Let's add the green tea, bam, back to normal. Same here, we're up here and bam, back to normal. Same with this one. These are all biochemical markers of cancerous cell change. So the FIP made it bad and boom, you add the green tea extracts, two types, and we're back to normal. Well, that's super cool for a dish. So what about a human? What is tea doing? Tea is inhibiting cell damaging free radicals, right? It sends these polyphenols like EGCG through your bloodstream to stop tumor production, invasion, and metastases. And there's even evidence that just like the sulforaphane and broccoli sprouts that we talked about, EGCG can halt the replication of cancer stem cells, the masterminds of recurrence and death. So tea helps with glucose regulation. It fights plaque buildup in your arteries. It's got a lot of benefits, but let's just talk cancer for a second. This study looked at 1160 breast cancer patients followed nine years and those who consumed three cups of green tea a day and had stage one cancer had 57% less recurrence than women drinking less tea than that. And for my stage two ladies, a 31% drop in recurrence. Pro tip, 
a squeeze of lemon, remember citrus and its antioxidant properties, well, a squeeze of lemon into your green tea will bump the antioxidant absorption of EGCG by five times. So quintuple your absorption by a squish of lemon. And if you're not a huge fan of green tea, as I am frankly not, I, find, I, I can drink it, it's fine, but I kind of have to plug and chug. I don't love it because I don't add anything to it, like any kind of creamers, even you know plant-based ones, et cetera, sugars. So I don't really love it. I throw it into my smoothie, which I'm gonna talk to you about. And I have other great recipes in my Cancer Kicking Kitchen that just might change your taste buds mind about that, like my green tea matcha latte, but also, since I really want you to reap the rewards from green tea, just, you know, add it to a smoothie and never taste it. We also um, have a, our own brand. It's called Ancient Matcha, and it's 100% organic. It contains the entire leaf, and studies have shown on this particular matcha that it delivers up to 137 times the amount of antioxidants than some regular off-the-shelf green teas. So it's certified and sourced directly from Japan. And for those of you, by the way, who might um, be anxious that caffeine will make you even more anxious with a fast heart rate and wide awake at night, um, for you, just know a couple things. Three cups of green tea equals the caffeine content of one cup of coffee. And decaf is fine. The caffeine is not the magic in the matcha. So decaffeinated green tea has one third the antioxidants of caffeinated, but drinking some tea is always better than none. So drink the decaf if you prefer. Um, I have a, some friends that, um, they, they created a decaf matcha green tea that actually has no drop in the EGCG um, component. Wait, wait, here it is, same egg. So they have an edible green tea, S-E-I-M-E-E. -E. This is an amazing green tea that will be decaf for you. But if you want the caffeine, eat your matcha. Okay, so here's my summary slide. This is from my book, and it's how to eat to beat breast cancer. Basically, you just want to load up 70% of your plate with tons of vegetables and delicious fruits, 15 and 15 with whole grains and healthy proteins. So take a snapshot of that down it every day, eat the rainbow, and you don't really have to hyper-concentrate on all these 18 foods, but you might have a high risk for breast cancer. You might have breast cancer and you're worried about recurrence. So if you really, really wanna make sure you're getting these foods into your body on a near daily basis, I find that the two simplest ways are a smoothie and then a clever little meal. So let me show you, here are our 18 foods. 13 of the 18 easily go into my smoothie. The recipe is right there at pinklotus.com slash smoothie. And in that original recipe, I don't have these five, four, which are super easy to add, obviously, citrus. I would even suggest throwing in the peel if you're not adverse, like if you just wanna do a wedge of lemon, throw that in. But of course, tangerines and oranges are a little sweeter for a smoothie. You can do that tablespoon of cacao, which also gives you two grams or just a teaspoon apple red apple half of it get the skin in there um 10 red grapes for your resveratrol but the base of the smoothie is soy it's one and a half cups of soy milk if you're going to have a bunch of tofu today maybe cut the soy milk down use water but here's the thing i've done a bunch of studying to try to figure out so igf1 which it just know that it's bad and it's required for basically all cancer and all type 2 diabetes to occur igf1 gets stimulated elevated to a more than necessary for today's functions by eating all animal protein and animal fat in eggs. However, could there be some plants where the protein actually stimulates IGF-1 so it's bad also? I did a deep dive and I came up with finding out that yes, if you had six servings of soy, full serving soy a day uh, in whatever form, you will elevate your IGF-1. Three servings was definitely safe, and I couldn't find any clear-cut evidence about four and five servings of soy a day. So basically, I don't want you elevating your IGF-1. I advocate for two to three servings of soy a day. You don't have to freak out if you had my smoothie and then you had tofu at lunch. You're like having super physiologic mounts on a daily basis, and that's what's going to be required to set the stage for chronic inflammation and problems. But my point is... Soy is the base of the smoothie. And then you throw in like two fistfuls of leafy greens, like some kale and arugula, two cups of berries. You can cut that berries down if you're gonna add some of your citrus and apple and grapes. 
um, dietary fibers coming from all the berries and the flaxseed, but that's one of the thir the 13, right? So the fibers getting in there, there's your one to two tablespoons of flaxseed. Turmeric, of course, in the recipe is the piperine for the pepper. And remember your fat vehicle is gonna be in the flaxseed. We've got the allotonic one caps capful is a convenient ounce and then my ancient matcha green tea and their omla boss and brrr, blend it up it's about a 380 calorie delicious drink that you want to drink slowly i say slowly over 20 minutes simply so that you reach that satiety point otherwise you may down the smoothie and they go down like a tofu burrito and <laughs> you ate too much all right so um the other five that are missing look how easily they are incorporated into a delicious little something so for example just yesterday i sauteed up some crushed tofu and then i sauteed tomatoes i added onions mushrooms garlic right I sauteed all that up and then i served it on a whole grain toast and i topped it with a little crushed nori or the furry cocky you can get from trader joe's like that little thing that has the sesame seeds too so easy right this also is sounding a whole lot like pasta sauce uh, tomatoes, mushrooms, garlic, and you put that over a whole grain pasta, and again, sprinkle some seaweed on top, and boom, you hit all 18 in one day. Um, AJ graciously asked me about some of my things that I'm busy doing at the top of our hour, and I wanted to just reiterate, because I don't want you to miss out on this completely free, beautiful, deep community. It's called pinklotus.com slash power up, and it's bursting with ways to connect with others. You, you can educate yourself, you can fundraise, there's so much going on. Um, in the cancer kicking box here, I just wanted to highlight my cancer kicking um, kitchen offers now, Cook Lives with Chrissy and Dr. Christy. So Christy is a holistic nutritionist and a super smart, uh, decades long whole food plant-based advocate. And together we just team up and cook live for you. We do it on Zoom, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. But I encourage you to sign up via the website at the top here to Zoom because we answer your questions live. I can't monitor for chat streams, so I just pay attention to the Zoomers. And I always have a really fun giveaway. We gave away a beautiful teak wooden spoon set the other time. And uh, coming up, we've got tickets to my next uh, slide, Summit. So the Cancer Kicking Summit is at this gorgeous oceanfront resort called Terranea. And it's coming up, it comes up every October. So uh, in the interest of being evergreen, if you're watching this 10 years from now, and there's one coming up. So check us out, pinklotus.com slash summit. I deep dive into all of the medical pearls of wisdom that are steeped in science that have been proven to increase cellular health to maximize your overall joy and intensity with life because you just feel so darn good day after day. It's really all encompassing. It's not just about food. It's also about thoughts and community and meditating and fasting. And I get all into the fun science. So explore Power Up because there's also the Breast Buddies group that I told you kind of pairs um, stage for stage, age for age, newly diagnosed women with breast cancer, with those who have been there, done that, and you can meet up or for a cup of coffee or just talk um, on the phone, but you can meet someone who's really been through that journey. Crowd Cause is a fundraising platform. Maybe you've got a reconstruction coming up that insurance is underfunding, so Crowd Cause will come to the rescue. Breast Groups is our interactive online live connecting event um the other things we've got going on just explore around and you'll be so amazed there's so much going on if you like what i had to say today i learned a lot of what i said by forcing the deep dive into nutritional science and other aspects of medicine to be very factual and accurate in writing my book breast the owner's manual available in 10 languages so check it out it's on amazon it's at pinklotus.com elements also so elements in conclusion, it's um, become a leading online women's health and breast cancer store. It's bursting with very intelligent, uniquely formulated supplements and other items that address the needs of women before, during, and after a cancer diagnosis. And of course, everything is always vegan. Um, so just have have a look around. All right, everybody. I oh my God. That, was just a, that was a wonderful presentation. It's the kind you can watch over and over. I love when doctors do PowerPoints because I, I love the visual aspect of it. 
I do too. I, it makes it more fun to pay attention. <laughs> I, I think I'd pay more attention. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I want it in podcasts so I can listen. But if, if my eyes aren't engaged, my ears aren't either for some right. reason. Visual listening. It's real. Dr. Funk, do, do you have time for just maybe a couple of questions that were sent in in advance for you? Yes, you bet. Thank you so much. Because this one, I know you have to do a procedure, but it's an important one because, um, you know, I haven't had done over a uh, you know, 1100 shows, and I have not yet had a do medical doctor come on and promote alcohol. But this person whose name is Bonnie says, could you please ask her, ask Dr. Funk if drinking alcohol while taking tamoxifen makes it less effective? I only drink once or twice at most on the weekend, one to three drinks tops. Is it possible to stop taking tamoxifen before the five years and still benefit? So two questions there. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's not um, interfering with the metabolism of your tamoxifen to its activated form via the liver that does that um, activation. So don't worry about that in the quantities that you're drinking. There is not enough resveratrol or aromatase inhibition present in red wine to outcompete what swallowing down a little tamoxifen pill is doing every day. So absolutely not, you can't sub. And by the way, I mentioned red wine. All other alcohol is just truly acetaldehyde, carcinogenic, decreases immune function, actually increases estrogen levels, and has no therapeutic nutritional value whatsoever. So if we're talking about white wine or hard liquor or beer or gin, what have you, none of that is healthful. There's just the slightest redemptive qualities of red wine, but no non-drinker should ever start drinking red wine uh, for the purported benefits of resveratrol and aromatase inhibition. Just chomp on those red grapes and blueberries and you are all good. Thank you so much. Everybody's going crazy saying, should I get a mammogram? I'm over 50. I eat this way. I think I know what you're going to say. I, you probably are guessing because I did imply it when I was talking now, as as great as the whole food plant-based lifestyle is, and including those who exercise regularly, avoid alcohol, maintain an ideal body weight, even maybe take very uh, careful stock of the estrogen disrupting compounds that may inhabit their cosmetics like phthalates or the BPA and plastic or the formaldehyde out their couch and the toxins that can build up in our laundry detergents and soaps, et cetera, right? You just feel like you've lived such a clean life. How could you possibly get breast cancer? How could you get colon cancer? And there are just more forces at play than we understand. I do think from my long experience now that the people who live that way and have for a decade plus do tend to get less virulent, less death causing uh, diseases or the cancers are less um, aggressive, but nonetheless, they're there and you never know unless you it, genetic testing isn't complete, right? So you could have just gotten your genes tested and you had 84 genes analyzed and you don't have any mutations, but you never know if you haven't tested at all, if you have one of these mutations and they really they're handicapped in a way that all of your good intentions and lifestyle behaviors aren't going to overrule what the lack of this gene's normal function is able to do for you. So you, you should screen for our most common cancers. And that includes getting a mammogram um, to look for breast cancer. I advocate uh, alongside the American Society of Breast Surgeons that people at normal risk for breast cancer should begin at age 40. Don't stop and don't skip years until you think you're gonna die in the next 10 years admittedly hard to predict. But the other options, I mean, there are other very reputable institutions, I'm not, um, organizations advocating for every other year or start at age 50, not 40. And I just individualize it. At the end of the day, you're you, they're your breasts. It's your breast cancer to hopefully never get. Or if you do get, hopefully it's early and very curable. But if you want to go every other year, if you want to go every three years, that's fine by me. Maybe we supplement. Maybe we do screening ultrasound, which basically has zero um, anything, right? There's no radiation. There's no injections. So I, I do um, individualize my strategies with people, but as a, like, just doctor hat on and giving you advice, start at 40 and get your mammogram. And people are saying, is thermography okay? Inside? Thermography is fine. Um, it's safe. I wish it were effective. I have analyzed more swirls of heat on breast thermograms than um, I care to count because I find them inaccurate, unfortunately. I wish, it's just such, it sounds so awesome to just, it makes sense, angiogenesis, right? We talked about how blood vessel formation comes that brings heat. So in areas of higher heat relative to the background breast, 
what's going on right there? Why is there so much heat? Why is there blood flow? Is it cancer? The irony is what you were trying to avoid, I'm guessing, was like a mammogram or an ultrasound or an MRI or a biopsy. All of those things now come into our bag of tricks to try to hunt down what the thermogram found, um, which more often than not isn't really anything. Um, I just don't find it to be accurate. It needs to be better than what we already have, and it's just not. And watching you do that procedure on the doctors, that was, I mean, that's amazing that you just do it on television like that. I know the whole audience just gasped when the, I was gasping <laughs> watching it, even though if the patient wasn't, I was like, oh my God, you know, anytime I see a needle, that's incredible. Well, speaking of breast cysts, Janet's saying she read that castor oil packs can help reduce breast cysts. Is there any evidence of the benefit of that? Ooh, I'd have to do a little literature search for you on that one. I do have women who are breastfeeding, who have mastitis, who have found great relief from castor oil packs. Um, and I can imagine that it would help. Cysts can be inflamed. So if they're inflamed, it's going to help. But you can also have a cyst that's just a fluid filled sac. I mean, 85% of women have cysts in their breasts at some point in their lives. So they're so common that they might not really be that active in responding to something topical like castor oil. But it, hey, it definitely doesn't hurt. So if you're thinking it makes it feel better or shrinks it, go for it. A couple of live viewers are asking the way you're mentioning to eat, would it also help other kinds of cancers, either maybe reversing them or preventing them? Absolutely. Yes, it does. So all of the, the um, cascade of events that happen when you chew and swallow the foods I'm talking about, not only decrease estrogen, which was the theme of today's talk, and not most, except for prostate cancer, most aren't really hormone dependent, right? But when we're talking about pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, brain cancer, they all ultimately thrive in an environment of inflammation, oxidative stress, DNA damage, and free radical formation. And eating plants squelches all of that inflammatory nonsense that leads to what it's basically a cell microenvironment. You can think of your cells like sitting in a little bathtub and that water there, if it's filled with all of the bubbles and bath salts and little loofah pads that cancer loves, meaning inflammation, free radical damage, um, estrogen for breast cancers, then it's just so happy in its tub. And what you want to do is neutralize the water. So apoptosis happens. It's got nothing it needs. It can't survive. It explodes. I like that word, apoptosis. That's a good I one. Do. I love that. Uh, Paige says, if somebody already had a double mastectomy, what would you recommend for that person? So if you had a double mastectomy, assuming it was for a cancer, unfortunately, the statistics are somewhere around 28% of all early stage breast cancers. By definition, that would be your stages 0, 1, 2, and 3A eventually recur metastatic as an incurable stage four. So not to put that threat out there, but just to know that although doing a bilateral mastectomy can feel so like final and curative, it really depends on the initial biology of that cancer to know how serious you need to be about help, trying your best to prevent a, um, to minimize a recurrence or mortality from that cancer. So for sure, eating the way that we've talked about today and maintaining an ideal body weight, exercising, treating your emotional stress through meditation or gentle stretching or social connection, love, forgiveness, all of these things matter in terms of recurrence. And like one of the other questions said, what about all of these uh, diet and lifestyle behaviors for other cancers? Well, you're a human body with a bunch more organs that might get cancer one day. So changing, using the breast cancer and the mastectomy moment to really like wake up and radically alter what had been that cell microenvironment that allowed the cancer to happen can radically alter the course of your life into one transformed into pure health and nothing but joy and optimal function forever. Thank you. Uh, Laura wants to know, have any of your patients beat breast cancer just through diet alone? That's a great and dangerous um, idea. So it's yes and no. I have patients who, and they uniformly have an estrogen driven breast cancer. They tend to be a little bit overweight and they will go on an anti-estrogen pill. So be it like aromatase inhibitor, say aromasin, or tamoxifen. Okay. I put them on that and I, they do the full on conversion. Like they're all in whole food, plant-based eating, daily exercise, management of their stress. I watch them like a hawk every six weeks, they come back to the office and I ultrasound the cancer to make sure that it's shrinking and not growing. 
and I am, have a growing repertoire of patients who, yes, eventually we operate. I usually, we usually do that for six months. Oh, and fasting. Fasting is a big part of that. Um, and I have a number of patients who, when I go in, what was a mastectomy, because they had a 10 centimeter tumor or something very deforming, if you did a lumpectomy, it's shrunk down so much that I could just do a lumpectomy. They got to preserve their breast tissue and the cancer had shrunk into, you know, incredibly. I have had some shrink and disappear under that regimen, always with the anti-estrogen pill, though I haven't had anybody do um, pure diet lifestyle without the pill and have the cancer become what we call a PCR, a path complete response. Like I take out the tissue where it used to be and hmm, there's nothing there but dead cells or you can't see anything. So it's possible. It's a very special subset of breast cancer. Um, they're fairly indolent and they always love estrogen. There are other subsets where you try that and unfortunately, that cancer just has so much of a heads up on you, knowing that it was growing and recruiting all of its blood vessels and acidity that it needed in order to exist and thrive and metastasize that you're a little late to the game to be trying these interventions now. And it's already about to be gone and conventional treatments help but more. Yeah. I don't know if you're allowed to answer this, but they want to know if any of your high profile patients went whole food plant based after being your patient. Oh, <laughs> um, well, uh, one of them, which is out there in People Magazine, et cetera, so I can repeat it, is Ellen Pompeo. So we had a fun conversation when she does not have breast cancer, did not have breast cancer, um, but just in the name of overall health, she was motivated to go plant-based. That's wonderful. I mean, is that something you kind of talk about to every patient, just maybe in conversation? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I try to be, you know, usually I do my own screening ultrasounds, which gives me a good 15 minutes to have them captive. Like they're laying there with their breast exposed and their arm up. Where are you going to go, girl? You got to listen to me. So I usually start by just, you know, asking what they eat, how they eat. And then we go from there. That's fantastic. Just let me know. I know you have a procedure. So just tell me last question and then we can stop because I want to respect your time. Oh, they, thank you. They, okay. They yeah, love. we probably do have just one more question that Cedars Great. will get. Me. Well, Mike, I, I want to ask my question. You have the most beautiful teeth. How do you do that? That's what oh, I you're want. so sweet. My mom was a dental hygienist, and so she was obsessed with teeth. So I did have braces. That's why they're straight. Um, and honestly, I just use a Sonicare toothbrush. I think that's key. And you know, I they think are beautiful, they like you. I mean, people were commenting. You can't just your teeth are so beautiful. Well, you, you you know you're welcome back anytime. Whether you have something to promote or not, you always have a space on the schedule. So please feel free to come back anytime because people really appreciate your talks. And I love your fan base, Chef AJ. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and I will come back again. Thank you so much, Dr. Funk. Guys, check out all the links. I'm going to sign up for her cooking show on Wednesday. I can't wait. And thanks for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow. The show will be at 1 p.m. And my guest is Mike Young, who actually wrote a book on longevity. Take care, everyone.